I see some familiar faces, so thank you for coming. Anyone who knows me, thank you for coming. Uh, I hope that it was because of me and not because of Globis that you came, or is it the other way around? I, I do have actually um, uh, strong connections with Globis, um, and uh, we're working on the Motify uh, side. We're working actually on, uh, on a project. We're scoping the details, but I, you know, I'll spare you, um, I'll spare you the, the, the boring conversations. So anyway, um, as introduced, um, you know, my background uh, has been in uh, Morgan Stanley and Google, and uh, I've always worked uh, with uh, people and organization as, as sort of the, the two main core problems that, uh, you know, I was so trying to solve. And I believe that, that as a, as a white-collar worker, your, your job is to solve problems, and your job to, is to get rid of your job, right? So I, I came to a conclusion at a certain point that um, working for myself is actually going to be more fun than working for Google, right? Google is a nice place to work, but it doesn't, um, you know, still as an organization, it, 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 it um, limits you to the degree, right? You have your daily job, even though you can do your 20% role, you have 80% of your time committed to some, some, some goals that some other people may, may uh, want you to deliver. Um, so today I'll, I'll give you some perspective from the sort of dark side and the colored side of the slides, right? Uh, Morgan Stanley actually ironically was the, the best place to work in Japan when I joined the company and it was growing frantically. And uh, I remember at that time I was wearing, you know, uh, red neckties and some of you are wearing neckties and white shirts uh, and I thought that people wearing t-shirts were uh, you know, the sort of on the other end of the society, right? And if you go, do you know Rigoletto in uh, Roppongi Hills? If you went to Rigoletto and, and downstairs there was a, um, a bar called Heartland. Does anyone remember Heartland? Um, it, it was, uh, it was, um, it had a, a certain reputation, right? So it, it had a lot of white guys in, in, in white shirts with red neckties and a lot of cute Japanese girls, right? So you could, you could imagine what that led to. Um, it's gone right now, right? It's gone for, for certain reasons. It's, it's gone because those white guys in red neckties were gone from the building as well. Lehman, Lehman shock uh, happened and Lehman Brothers uh, moved out. Uh, Goldman Sachs shrunk. Right now the bar Rigoletto is actually filled with people uh, wearing t-shirts, ironically. And these come from Google, Apple, and uh, some other Japanese startups, right? So you see sort of the, the, the switch in, the, in, in who's fashionable right now. Uh, that's why I, 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 t I tend not to wear um, uh, suits, because if I wear a suit, I have to lower my consulting fees. <laughs> I, really, really. So um, anyway, um, what, what do I do? Um, so Pronoia Group is a, is, a, is a boutique consultancy focusing on uh, innovation strategy, but we, we don't work as, as... Anyone from McKinsey here? Anyone? No? Sorry, because I'm, I'm going to offend McKinsey people a lot today. So, so sorry for that if you're ex-McKinsey, but we're not, we're not McKinsey. We're not coming to, to tell you what you have to do and bringing you templates. We work with the, the team uh, collaboratively and, and learn together. So for example, today I was working with a, a large Japanese tobacco maker. Um, I, I can't tell you the name, but it's a tobacco maker, Japanese, right? Um, and we, we were talking about uh, using technology in terms of, uh, of changing the organization. And, and the, 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 the HR director, he said, you know, we don't know what the project could be, but we want to learn together. So that's sort of a work that I, I, I like to do. Uh, and then I realized that um, consulting is a, is a very, very hard uh, physical work, right? It's, it's, you, you have to be in front of the client, you have to spend hours, you have to prepare, you have to be switched on, you always have to be you know, fully on in the flow state in front of the clients because otherwise they won't pay you money, right? They need to be excited. Um, so I, I, I realized that this, as a business model is not sustainable and I'm gonna die sooner or later. Um, so uh, that's why uh, I co-founded with a, a, a different partner uh, Motify, which is a, an HR technology uh, company, and, and we're trying to uh, build technology that changes the way people work and, and, and people think and makes better organization. Um, so two books introduced already. There are two in the pipeline, and, and I was talking about the fifth one today. Um, I'm also uh, working um, in some different ways as well. So the first pillar being consulting, second being startup. The, the third pillar is, um, is, is um, more and more about um, 
spreading the news, right? So introducing new ways of thinking, and, and that's why the books, uh, I'm a, 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 a columnist with Newspeaks, and, and some other things are going to come soon, but uh, I'll spare you the details. Also, I have a fourth pillar, which is about anything that's outside of that which is new, new business development. And uh, it could be uh, small investments, it could be working um, on uh, art projects, it could be working on a radio program. Actually, I'm, I'm talking to Tokyo FM right now about potential uh, engagement. Um, so you see, when you sort of, when you, when you leave the, the, the corporate chains, right, the, there's, there's way more uh, for you to, um, to find, right? And, and I didn't know I would be doing all these things two years ago, right? I knew that I was leaving, I knew that I would start my own consulting business, but what else comes? You don't know. So you have some, some things that you bring to the world, but then the world responds to you, right, in one way or, or another, and then it, it tells you what it wants you to bring. And people come and they say, Piotr, how about doing this? How about doing that? Uh, and if you listen carefully and you, you expand yourself, uh, you could do very, very different things than what you think you should be doing, right? So with that in mind, let's uh, talk about me uh, for a moment, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the more interesting things than me. But I was born in Poland in 1975, uh, February 11th, which is the Kenkoku Kinembi. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm have the same uh, Tanjobi as um, birthday as, as Japan. Uh, always get a free day from from my birthday from the Japanese government. That's why I chose Japan to be the country, my residence. Uh, what other country gives you a, a day off on, on your holiday? But um, anyway, uh, I, I grew up in a very small village, or, or I didn't grow up there, but I was born there. Uh, 50 people, 150 dogs, more or less, more or less and then cows and other beasts. Um, but in 1981, uh, what happened uh, was the solidarity Lech Wałęsa, you may have the, the name, uh, started uh, a movement against the Soviet Union, against this, the communism, right? So, so what you saw at that time was uh, a threat to the, the governing force, Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union responded very wisely, meaning if you don't stop, we're gonna, um, we're gonna crush you. Um, and then uh, the, the government in, uh, introduced military law, and for about uh, four years, that was more or less what the country looked like. So if you imagine, for example, going into shop, right? I don't know if you can see it, but you, these, are, these are shelves in, in, in stores, right? Uh, and for some reason, there was always, uh, always, always a lot of vinegar in any supermarket. I still don't understand why, and if you can understand, then tell me. But, but otherwise, things were portioned, right, and rationed. And you would have these nice... Uh, coupons that you would get every month, and for example, it says 100 gr uh, 1,000 gram of uh, of flour. Uh, it says 500 gram of sugar. So these were portions of, of food that we were getting. Um, it wasn't a very uh, pleasing environment for six years old, right? Imagine not having chocolate when you're six years old, right? I, I don't know how many of you were born in North Korea, but I, I think the, 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 the only comparison to the, the, the situation currently existing in the world is probably North, North Korea, maybe Somalia. Um, but, but that was my, my, my beginning. Then in 1989, what happened in 1989? The Iron Wall, the Iron Curtain, you know, the Berlin Wall uh, fell, Leif Wawensa and Post Solidarity actually started the movement. Um, and um, uh, at that time, uh, something very interesting happened in my life, which was um, around me in my village, there was no one who's been to high school. And uh, I sense that if the, if, you know, the movement, looking at the politics, looking at, at the TV, something's, gonna, something's new going to happen, right? So probably capitalism is going to come into Poland. And when I watch American movies, you see these doctors driving big cars, etc. So I, I realized that the, there's a value in education. Um, the, the government didn't tell me that I should be educated because they didn't want me to be educated, right? The communists don't want people to be educated and, and wise because they want to keep people in, under control. Um, and it's interesting because at that time, when you were um, a factory worker, you would be earning as much as, uh, as a globis, uh, well, there wasn't globis, but as a university teacher, for example. So why the heck go through all these years of, of, of torture and, and get your PhD uh, if you can go to an occupational school and, 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 you know, and, and live, right? Now, that, hap that, that finished 
1989. People didn't know that it would finish. So I have two brothers, for example. They went to occupational schools. And uh, in 1989, both of them lost their jobs, right? As, as, as well as 95% of the other people around, around us, right? All the, the factories, the, the, you know, um, the bigger sort of um, organizations, they were closed. Uh, they were bought up by uh, companies from Germany, for example, because I was close to the German border. Sorry for the Germans here. But um, they, what they did is they closed the companies and they started importing their own goods, right? At prices three to five times higher than the, 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 the prices uh, in Poland at that time. Uh, one of my brothers actually ended up being alcoholic because of, of the, the, the situation and he died. Um, so for me, it's, it's, a, it's a very important thing to tell you because I feel that Japan is in a sim similar spot right now. You, whether you go to university and get your uh, Shinsotsu job, you, you're going to get, let's say, 200,000 200, yen a month, right? You can do the same, you can get the same money working at a convenience store, right? So it's 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 slightly it's slightly surprising, right? It's it's, it's there's something maybe um, fishy there, but anyway. Uh, so I did when I did go to high school, I did go to university, and you know did many things, and ended up here. But um, so the, the story about me is finished. What I wanted to show you is, you know, there's the spirals in life, right? And some people that I knew at that time ended up in this downward spiral, including my brother. For some reason, you know, I ended up in this upward spiral by expanding my choices. And I believe that uh, success is not, you know, what, what, you, what money you have. It's not what house you live in. Uh, why do we want money? We want choices, right? We want to have a free choice of what you eat, what you where, uh, who you talk to, where you go, right? Money allows that. So success is about increasing your, your options and your, your, your choices. In any, any situation I put myself into, I try to understand what are the, the next um, choices that this situation will, uh, will give me. Um, some of you may know this, uh, Fibonacci sequence is it's, it's considered to be the, the beauty pattern. So if you look at this, for example, thank you for preparing the flowers, right? So this is Fibonacci sequence, right? So the shape is, is growing. It's, 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 it's simply the, the, the two previous numbers become the, the next number. So one plus two is three, two plus three is five, and then five, uh, three plus five is eight. 5 plus 8 is, and so on and so on, right? So, so it grows exponentially. And I have this, this very, really, really um, weird theory that, that this is actually, um, this is a pattern of the exponential change that we are facing right now, but it's also a pattern of success. It's a pattern of how do you expand your ne next choices, right? And if, if you expand those choices, the next, the next choice is going to be way bigger, right? So it's not only about the flowers, actually, flowers follow the, the pattern. Uh, human faces and human bo bodies, beautiful faces and beautiful bodies, <laughs> have actually, um, you know, the, the balance of Fibonacci sequence. So, so keep this in mind as, as you listen to me, because this is the question I have for you. Uh, are you ready to get fired? And I, I'll, I'll tell you why in a, in a second. So in uh, the 19th century, there was a, an industry that was very, very successful. It was called ice harvesting. And you could see people going to very cold places and cutting ice. And then uh, they would increase innovation. So they would build uh, tools to cut ice faster. So do the same thing faster, more effectively, more efficiently. Right? Japan is right now uh, very focused on efficiency, on cutting working hours and going home earlier and being efficient. And you have all these magazines about how to be efficient, how to do your, you know, jikan uh, kanri and, and whatnot and whatnot. So it's about doing the same thing faster. And you, you could see the ICE uh, 1.5 introducing uh, machines, etc. But fundamentally, this was a wrong business model. So what happens next? Uh, next, you have ice factories. So people from I outside the ice harvesting industry come in, and they build factories that make ice, right? So out of a sudden, they, they put all the ice harvesters out, out of business, right? So imagine at that time, 19th century, you lose your job, you probably die, um, right, of hunger. Um, you starve. But anyway, uh, then again, you, you see incremental innovation there, introducing new machines, introducing faster ways of uh, transporting ice, and then what happened? This, right? Um, so a uh, fridge was created, again, not by people who were building ice factories, but by someone else. 
someone else from a different field. And then you see the um, incremental innovation there as well, so a radio being added to a uh, fridge. I don't know how many people have a, a radio in the fridge right now, <laughs> unless you put it in, right? But, uh, but, but you see, you know, incremental in innovation may not really work. Uh, what you need at times is really, really stop what you're doing and do something else, completely else. Uh, so that's one of the messages today, but I'm going to strengthen this in a moment. So, um, so th this, is, this is exactly the same pattern that we see right now with all the, the platform businesses, the technologies, for example. Airbnb, anyone doesn't, who doesn't know Airbnb? Do you know Airbnb? So Airbnb, what, what is an Airbnb? It's, a, it's an online platform that connects people who have places who can rent places and people who want to, to, uh, to stay at a place. And it's interesting because you can be a customer and you can be uh, an owner and you, depending where you are, you can, you can do both, right? So it's a typical online um, internet platform business. Now they have about two and a half thousand employees, 21 offices rented. They don't own any of their offices. They, have, they, they cover about uh, 33,000 uh, cities. Actually, they cover more than that right now. But um, if you look at Hyatt, the biggest uh, hotel uh, company in the world, they have about 45,000 employees. Actually, I hear more. There's even more. They kept hiring. 549 properties in 549 cities, right? There's one Hyatt in Tokyo. Correct or more? Am I wrong? Um, now, if you, this is where, where this is, becomes, this becomes a Globis, Globis lecture. Look at the valuation, right? Uh, Airbnb's valuation is actually uh, three times bigger than Hyatt's, right? Now, why is that? Do you want to talk or should I tell you? Would you like to talk? Why don't you spend a minute talking to your, your friend next to you and, and just tell me, you know, why, why is this possible? This, this is weird, isn't it, right? So find yourself a partner sitting next to you um, and try to find reasons why this is possible. Okay. Okay. So this is this is a collective, a crowd intelligence moment. A collective intelligence moment. Can I? Can we? Can we see? So, is there any volunteer who would like to talk? You know, any anyone who likes talking in front of people? If yes, raise your hand. If not, can I, I just let, let me do the, the, the military vo volunteering, right? I, I was used to. So I did military training in my um, primary school in, uh, in Poland. Imagine military training in primary school. Have you done your military training? So you're probably in danger right now. But I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a Polish gentleman, so I'm going to go ladies first. Could you, could you share some, some of, of your ideas? And then you can find the next victim and just, just give the mic to them. <laughs> You have no idea. Yeah. So, pass my partner. Okay. So, uh, basically, I thought that the Airbnb case has uh, more, I think, the possibility to expand the business. Yeah. So, scalability is much more than the hired case. And uh, they don't need uh, any real estate, so the risk is much less. <laughs> when the teacher asks a question, and um, you know, the teacher looks at you, everybody goes like. Uh, anyone? Uh, how? Long time no see. Pass, pass. pass. Uh, I think I, I will need to explain this to you then. Uh, if, you, uh, if you guys. Um, no, uh, is this on? It's off. Okay, let me just turn it off. Let's make sure that, that there's no um, no feedback. So, so let's look at some some basic facts. Um, Airbnb um, is um, fully focused on uh, leveraging their resources, right? They don't almost they, they they don't own anything. They don't own beds. They don't own hotels, right? So their their, their cost is is quite low. 
Uh, now, they have clear interfaces, which are portal and application, whereas Hyatt has feedback sheets in the rooms. How many of you fill in feedback sheets in hotel rooms? One, two, three? You know, I haven't done it in my life. I've seen the, many of them, but I, in, in using Airbnb, you actually have to, have to do that. You have to assess the property and then the owner and, and vice versa. Uber has the same, right? So, so what happens if people have to do, give feedback? The, the, the service becomes better, right? And the users, just because you're a user, you're connected, right? And they know who you are if you give, you know, if you, you, you give wrong feedback. So, so there's visibility on who talks to whom about what, and then the service becomes better. And then they are using, uh, Airbnb is using clear algorithms, right? So technology in terms of search, ranking algorithms, and then data uh, to see uh, what's happening in real time. So they have real time OKR, OKRs, objective key results, search rankings and, and so on and so on. Now Hyatt has only check-in data, that's, that's more or less what they know about you and what's happening at the moment. Now let's look at the people side which uh, is also interesting. Missions. Airbnb's mission is to bring world's peace one room at a time, right? So uh, not to offend any, any, any Chinese people here but I go to China a lot um, and still in China if you switched on the, the TV at night you will see a lot of um, uh, TV series around, around Japanese atrocities in, during the, the World War II. Who's right, who's wrong, you know, let's not go there. But, but there's a lot of coverage in, in, in the media. You, you see, you know, you see people, uh, you, you see in, the, in those TV dramas, you see Japanese, bad Japanese soldiers coming to kill Chinese people. The same happens in Poland. Bad German soldiers come and kill Polish people. The same happens in other countries, like, uh, you know, probably uh, Iraq right now, bad American soldiers come and, and, and kill people. So, so anyway, uh, that's, not, not, that's not good, right? But, uh, and, and what happens if you see, uh, are you sort of, are you able to hang around Ginza around lunchtime or maybe 10 a.m. when the, uh, the, the, the department stores open? Right when the department stores open, you see buses coming, coming up, right? And, and tourists, uh, inbound tourists, right, come out. A lot of, the majority of them are Chinese, obviously, just because of the size of the country. Uh, they go buy, buy things, they get on the bus, they go back, right? These people have no, no way of engaging with Japanese people, right? Uh, now, if you stay in an Airbnb property, if it's a, a, a not a, a sort of like Airbnb business, but an, a, a family-owned property, you have a chance to actually see the lives of, of the people who live in the country. Now, what happens if you interact with people in their own homes? We have this instinct that when we're invited home, we're friends, right? We, we're not going to attack these people. We, we are curious about, you know, what they do. We, 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 then the people who invite us, they give us breakfast and so on and so on. So there, there's an opportunity for people to interact. And Airbnb is working on other services right now to, to increase interactions of people who are visiting a country, visiting a place, and the local people. So for example, uh, tour, tour guides, etc. By increasing interactions between individuals, you have larger potential of, of world peace. Yes? Now, Hyatt's uh, mission is we provide authentic hospitality. Now, let's try. So, who of you is really, really moved by Hyatt's vision? Now, raise your hand if it moves you, if it touches your heart. Right? Uh, who, who is moved by Airbnb's vision? Okay, you see more, more people. And some of you who haven't raised your hand at all, they are probably, you're probably not moved at anything, right? So, so, so that's fine. So then you, you see clear community engagement. So Airbnb works with people to build their own communities and to, to, to customize Airbnb for themselves, right? And what happens when people have communities, right? They, they start meeting, they start engaging, and so on and so on. Uh, now, Hyatt has the gold passport. I, I do have a card. I don't know where it is. I've never used it. Um, so ver it's very useful, right? Um, and then two very important things. Airbnb's focus on full employee autonomy and full experimentation, right? Protot constant prototyping. And uh, they were the first company that moved away from the term HR. Um, they, they moved towards the term employee uh, experience, right? So they, they connected the, the facilities, they connected the HR thinking into one place where people are really, the, there are employees caring uh, for other, for how employees experience the company. 
So how do you create the best possible experience for people who come to work here uh, just because they have, have full autonomy and they have, uh, they have to experiment all the time? But anyway, so these are typical companies like Airbnb as well. We call them exponential organizations. Uh, you see Airbnb, Google Ventures, Vav, a gaming co company, Tesla. So they, they are actually, they are, it doesn't need to be a technology company, right? It could be any other company, but uh, they're using similar um, ways of, A, building the business around mission, mission vision that, that excites people, and using technology to its full, fullest possibility right now, minimizing costs by, uh, you know, cutting the unnecessary things like uh, feedback sheets and the rooms. Anyway, so you see this disruptive innovation term, you know, 80% um, of, of companies, everybody's running around and talking about disruptive innovation, but in fact, only half of, of companies right now are actually doing something around disruptive innovation, right? Looking actively into who, who the heck is trying to steal our business? You know, where are the startups that we maybe can invest in? Only half of companies actually do something meaningful. And then you look at what companies are succeeding uh, and what companies are not. So the, 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 the red ones are not succeeding anymore. And they do often have economies of mass. Uh, so the traditional companies, uh, the infrastructure organizations, and they, they are trying to work on uh, incremental engagements, uh, sorry, incremental improvements. But you see communities actually, platforms, that, um, that they, they deal with very high level of uncertainty. Communities work on smaller scales, platform businesses like Google, um, like Apple, like Airbnb, they, they, they uh, maximize the economy of, of uh, economies of mass. But anyway. So what's, what do they have in common? The first thing, uh, if you look at, at uh, the so-called unicorns, so the companies that exceed billion dollar valuation, how many of, of them do we have in, in uh, uh, Silicon Valley? I don't know, M many, many, many. A lot in India, for example. How many in Japan? Do you know? One. What's the company? Merukari. Yes, it's only one, one company that is a, a, a unicorn. It's, it's alarming, isn't it? <laughs> the third largest economy in the world with one unicorn company. Guys, do something. Right. So, so what, what are the commonalities? The first, they have easy to dismiss ideas. Stupid, seemingly stupid ideas like staying in someone else, sleeping in someone else's bed, or having a tourist sleeping in your bed while you're out. Right? Uh, in 2006, a friend asked me whether I was using Facebook, and I, I laughed at her and I said she was stupid because I didn't understand why I should be putting my private information online. Now, right now, you, you look at my Facebook profile, 3,200 people, friends, right, and all these postings, right? I know I, know I was stupid. But anyway, why, why, why is uh, that important? They reinvent. Then what they do is they have zero monetization for, for you know, five to seven years of, uh, after the beginning of the company. Google, for example, seven to eight years, actually. No money, no monetization. Um, and they have untested founders. So once they, you know, they obviously gather the, the, user, the user base, they get money. But what's interesting, the untested founders, meaning the founders have no industry experience. Uh, Larry Page didn't have, and Sergey Brin, Brin didn't have advertising experience. Google is the biggest advertising engine in the world, right? Um, the founder of Facebook, he didn't have, you know, media experience at all, right? He just created something, and he was a student. So, anyway, I hope that that's a point for you, is you don't need to have experience to bring an idea out and make shitloads of money. Pardon my French. Um, anyway, so what's happening right now, uh, we, we see this area, this era of exponential change. So you, you have all these technological um, uh, shifts, you have global market competitions, dem demographic, demographic upheavals, and so on and so on. And there's, there's, there's changes that didn't happen in the past, accelerated speed, unpredictable competition, and so on and so on. Uh, and what happens in reality is we have new unknown success metrics. We don't know what the success metrics for a successful company uh, are going to be in five years' time, for example, right? If you compare Google, Facebook, Apple, their metrics, um, when they started, their metrics were, were not commonsensical to MBA classes, 
right? In fact, in, uh, in if you, for example, in 2000, the year 2000, if you you, you start explaining what Google does, what uh, Facebook might might do in an uh, in a in an MBA class, you probably would be laughed at, right? Because that wasn't the the the, the, the common commonsensical way of doing business. Anyway, so what's happening right now? We we see that the world is is really speeding up, and it's becoming more complex and more chaotic. And we are facing adaptive problems rather than technical problems. So technical problems could be simple, where you can bring best practice, and you first understand the problem, you categorize it, and you respond to it. So for example, um, you know, let's say you're, you're, you're shipping something, the, the, the product doesn't arrive, it's a simple problem. You need to figure out where the, the, where the heck the product is, right? Whether it was lost by the Japan Post, whether it's you know, sitting somewhere else, maybe the address was wrong, and so on. Then problems became, become more complicated, where uh, the cause, but still cause and effect can be connected, right? They, they, they are separated over time, but if you bring analysis, more analysis, more data, you can understand it. And then you, again, you sense, you understand what the problem is, you analyze and you respond. Then good practice becomes, uh, becomes the answer. So you, you can have various practices, various types of analysis, but if you understand what the problem is, you can solve it technically. Now, where, where we are right now is this complex reality where in which we, it, we, it's no, not the known knowns, it's not the known unknowns, it's we have unknown unknowns. We don't know what we don't know. And uh, the cause and effect may be only understandable after the problem has been solved, right? Um, so you look at new practices, emerging practices, where you need to probe, you sense, and then you respond. And then the chaotic problems, these are typical crisis situations where you, you need to have novel practice. You don't know what to do, but you need to survive. So let's say if we're hit by a huge earthquake right now, you will need to run as fast as possible probably, right? You will not be thinking, so acting is, is the first thing to do. So anyway, why is this important? It's important because two things are, are going to be crucial to your success. First, clues and data. The more data you have, data, uh, you know, it, it's great, but it makes your suitcase heavy. Um, now, insights make you rich, right? So you need, you need to be able to apply intuition. Intuition is, is a word that many business people frown upon, but intuition is the sum of your experiences, and it's, it's, the, you know, it's, 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 it's the sum of all knowledge that you have that you can apply within a, 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 a nanosecond, right? That's intuition. It's actually there's research, um, brain, uh, brain science research, uh, showing you know, how intuition works already. It's not, you know, some airy fairy thing. It's 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 how you how your body and your brain responds to, to a problem, and then you need to bring about insights. And insights are the most important things right now. So so what you can what, what really really distinguishes successful people from less successful people is the successful people bring insights. They bring actionable ideas, right? And then they get investments. Then they build a team, and then they you have a Merukari or you have an Airbnb. So anyway. Uh, anyway, let's uh, look at um, what's happening in the world right now, uh, and, and let's look at some some of the you know some of the changes. And I would like you to sort of look at those numbers. Don't don't analyze them, right? Uh, I, I realize that numbers and, and slides like this are the perfect hypnosis induction for business people. You bring I, I've actually tested this. You bring two slides with very different data sets. And one of them is wrong, one of them is right. And people still believe in, in both of the slides. You have the message without the data set, the right message without the data set, and you say the message, and people say, oh, show me the data, I, I don't believe it. Uh, then you put the wrong data in the face, and they t then they say, now I believe it, right? So, <laughs> so don't overanalyze the data, but apply, try to feel, feel the data, apply your intuition towards it. So if you look at, at, uh, at GDP, I'm gonna show you a, a, a number of data sets that maybe can, can help you think through uh, maybe your life and, and, and your business ideas. But GDP of uh, G7 countries was larger than GDP of E7 countries until 2014. 2014 they equaled. Right now, GDP of E7 countries is actually higher than G7 countries, right? So, so India, China, Brazil, Indonesia, and so on, that these countries are becoming more affluent. There's more money. Uh, in those countries. And then you will see that in 2015, it probably will double the, the GDP of, of uh, G7 countries. And the second uh, data point is, uh, you will see a lot of demographic changes in the world, in places like Europe and 
Japan are aging drastically. So it, is, it was predicted that by 2030, you will have about uh, you will have an average Japanese uh, at the age of uh, about 53 or 52, right? Uh, British will be about 42 years old. Chinese will be about 43 years old, right? On average. Now you see the red places, which is the youthful populations, 25 uh, years or younger. Africa uh, and some of the um, some of the, the the third world countries, they will still keep young populations. What does it mean? They have more access to internet, right? A, a, a Maasai. I know a Maasai leader who you know we've been bringing to Japan. He has a, a smartphone. He can access Google in the middle of his fields in Kenya, right? He has the same information to, to uh, the same access to information as Larry Page has in his own company, right? Imagine that. So young people with access to a lot of information. What does it create? Uh, then you have um, young people with better and better uh, education. Is it a threat to Japan or is it an opportunity, for example? Right? If you think of aging population here uh, and how do you solve workforce problems, you know, is it a threat or is it a, an opportunity? Now let's see at uh, what that also means to resources. So there will be, in, by 2030, there will be an estimated 8.3 billion people and 66% uh, will, leave, will live, sorry that's a mistake, in cities currently it's uh, 54%. So that creates uh, an increase in, in demand on food by 35%, water by 40%, and energy by 50%. What are these opportunities here for you? Right? Food, water, cl clean water, energy sources, right? All over the world. Uh, now let's look at this one. This is quite interesting. How many of you here are vegetarians? One? Oh, wow, great, fantastic. So finally, I found some vegetarians in Japan. First time someone, three people raised their hands. So if you see it, uh, at the, the, thank you vegetarians, because you are consuming half of the water that a carnivore like me would be consuming. So if you look at, for example, uh, wheat, 500 gram of wheat needs about 650 liters of water to be produced. Now, if you produce uh, beef, that's about 7,000 liters of, of water to produce 500 grams of two steaks. It's about 7,000 liters of water. Imagine how many baths that is. I mean, you may have bigger or smaller bathtubs, but just think of how many bathtubs of water you need to eat a steak, right? So maybe next time you eat a steak, you just try not to bathe, right? Because you've used a lot of water. So you either bathe or eat steaks. Actually, white meat like chicken takes less water. So the, 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 the darker the meat, chicken, like, uh, sorry, beef or lamb, uh, the more water you need to produce it. And then you have actually more greenhouse gases produced by cows than by cars. If you look at the same weight of, of a car, and, a, and let's say you, you have a, a bigger car, you have two cows, uh, a cow weighs about 500 kilograms, so maybe if you're, uh, right, if you're driving this small Japanese car, a car it's one cow, uh, this, this cow is going to produce more greenhouse effects than, than your car. I'm not discriminating against cows. They are nice animals, right? They're here in the world, they produce milk. But we need to understand the, the impact that things that we have around us in daily life have on, on, on the economy, have on the climate, have on the environment. Um, so th this set of data is available. You can check it online. You know, you could cross-check it. You can challenge me. But, but nobody's looking for the data, right? If you look at the data, you'll find insights, right? So maybe if you have a topic of interest, why, why don't you just go and start searching for the data around that topic and, and see where that data and your intuition brings you? So let's look at the next one. This is, this is quite brutal. Uh, this is entrepreneurial activity in the world. Japan is, uh, this, is, uh, this is last year, Japan was uh, the fourth worst uh, country in, uh, in the world, right? Fourth worst, after Suriname, Puerto Rico and Italy. You probably don't know what Suriname, where Suriname is. Some of you may know, not know where Puerto Rico is, right? But, but Japan, 1.3% of the population. The, the data means how, what, what percentage of the population started a business in the last 24 months, right? So I started two businesses. So you have a gaijin actually adding to that, that, um, th that statistic. But you wouldn't believe, but the most entrepreneurially uh, active country in the world right now is Uganda. 
28%. It doesn't mean that people started super uh, hot, you know, uh, startups, but they started businesses, right? So that, that there's, a, there's a hunger for growing because the infrastructure is missing. I went to Kenya uh, uh, a while ago, and I was, I was really, really mind blown uh, by the, the, the startups and, and the people, you know, the, the hungriness to do business. Uh, and they are young. They are under 25 years uh, average age. Now, uh, let's look at some other things. Uh, the technology. Digitalization is something that we often hear about, uh, which means things become data, right? So then when p things become data, data is very easy to store. And it's also not easy to see, right? Because it's data. So what happens is we're deceived, there's a deception. We miss the, 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 the amount of data that's actually available. And the data grows exponentially. Um, so simply um, then disruption is possible. Just because people have access to data and they can, they can utilize it to bring new business models, um, new things happen. Um, and then we see dematerialization. So obvious things like um, I, I don't have my smartphone on, uh, on me, but I see some of you having them. Um, if you look at the amount of things that you have in your smartphone uh, that you would be needing to carry on you uh, 15 years ago, you wouldn't be able to carry those, right? Uh, you, you start with a TV, then you have a phone, you have a camera, you have a, uh, an alarm clock, you have, uh, you, know, you have a calculator, and so on and so on. The list is endless. In fact, in, 19, in 1990, the worth of, um, of your uh, mobile phone, of your smartphone right now, would be about $900,000 just because of, of how many technologies you have in, your, in this small device. It's almost, for some, for, you know, some providers, you get your, your phone for free, right? The nine, $900,000 worth of things in your mobile, so utilize it, right? Anyway, so then demonetization happens. I mean, sim simple example, you don't buy uh, alarm clocks anymore, right? You have an alarm clock in your phone. And then democratization happens. So just because data is available everywhere, you can, uh, you know, you can bring, uh, bring about new business models. I was chatting with a gentleman who, uh, do you know Star, Star TV? Star TV in, in Asia. Uh, so a gentleman who started the Star TV by, uh, this is an interesting story, he's a friend of mine right by now, but um, he, uh, he bought a used uh, satellite from the US and he convinced uh, a Hong Kong investor to go to China, build a rocket and you know, shoot the, the satellite into the sky to build a satellite TV, uh, TV right? And he was approached at that time by a startup that was trying to do uh, video editing software for uh, individuals. And he laughed at them and said, who would want to do vi video editing? It's too expensive. It, it requires too much skill sets, right? Uh, TV editors vi edited video at that time. It was in 1990s. But right now you have video high quality vi video editing software in, on your MacBook, right? And if you're using Mac, it's very high cool quality uh, video editing software. And it's for free, right? And you can edit a video, you can put it on YouTube, you can do stuff around it, you can make money with the video possibly. So we see this uh, exponential change which is um, you know, invisible in many cases. Just because data grows, just because it increases, we, we are used to seeing linear growth, right? But the growth of things right now is not linear anymore. Um, and let's look at, at the growth of the hottest technologies, just, just to exemplify that. Uh, so top five, I'm going to show you top five hottest technologies uh, in the world. This is like a beauty pageant, so, so watch out. The first one is industrial robots, about 23 times uh, cost performance uh, increase in uh, five years, 23 times. So it's time, 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 time. Imagine, 23 times 100 yen, how much money you would have. You probably couldn't believe how many zeros there will be. So anyway, uh, drones, the second one, 140 times in six years. In fact, uh, how many Americans here? I, I don't want to, but I'm, I keep offending all these nationalities. And, uh, but American Army flies predator drones over places in, in the world and, and shoots people from those. A predator drone is worth about $1 million. Um, a do-it-yourself online community in the US created a drone 
that has 97% of the functionality of Predator. The 3% remaining is obviously no weapons, right? So you couldn't put weapons on a, on a drone right now. Uh, imagine how much it costs. Let's just give yourself a figure, and I'm going to tell you. $500 to build a drone of, of 97, with 97% functionality of a drone uh, built by you know, uh, a commercial company uh, that is worth $1 million, right? And it was, burn, it was created by an online community of people who have no drone building experience. It's like, if you have 100 people, I can tell you that in this group you can build a drone in a month. Because probably you will have uh, an engineer here, you will have someone who is, is interested in things, you will have uh, you know, maybe a, a software person, you will have people with access to you know, 3D printers and whatnot. You, you, could, you could do it. So anyway, the third one is 3D sensors, uh, which uh, right now they cost around you know, 50 to $80. So the sensors, for example, on, on self-driving cars, one sensor, uh, 250 times in five years, uh, 3D printing 400 times in seven years, and what's the best, the, the most developing technology in the world? It has to do with your, it has a direct impact on your life and your body. DNA, DNA sequencing, 10,000 times in seven years. 10,000 times, right? So the, the, it was uh, still worth uh, 10, 10 million, uh, sequencing your DNA uh, took about $10 million uh, in 2007. By 2014, it dropped uh, to 1,000. It's actually, it's still around that, that price, but it's going to drop again. Probably it's going to be, in, soon it's going to be cheaper than flushing your toilet, right? So you can sequence your d DNA anyway, and if you can sequence it, right, you, you, you have potential to clone yourself and, and do other interesting things. So uh, this is an interesting data set that I'm going to show you very quickly, which is about, um, again, McKinsey. In 1988, I think, was it? McKinsey told uh, AT&T in America not to go into mobile industry mobile phone industry, because they predicted but that at that time there would be no more than 100,000 people who wanted really mobile phones. So that wasn't a scale, and the mobile phones were huge, right? So, uh, so AT&T withdrew, and then they realized that uh, they were in big trouble uh, later on, right? They laid off a lot of people and almost went bust. But uh, in 2002, McKinsey said that uh, there would be uh, more or less 16% market growth, uh, so user, in, user increase in uh, the mobile industry. In reality, that was 100%. By 2004, they said, oh, 14%. It's going to slow down, maybe. Again, 100%. 100% 100 of 100%. That's 10,000. And times, right? And then in 2006, they said no way it's going to grow like this again 100 times just because of Steve Jobs, right? So uh, smartphones came out. 2008, they said no, it's going to slow down again uh, 100 times. And by that time, you had smartphones in Indonesia, uh, smartphones in some African places, places where there were no land phones, people using internet on, on smartphones out of a sudden, right? So imagine the, the, the potential of, of market growth in a country like Indonesia with uh, 200, whatever, 70 uh, million people, right, who don't have access to landline uh, phones. So this happens also in the, uh, in the investment uh, space. So uh, the years to a billion market cap, I need to say something that's MBA related. So, so here's the data, uh, Fortune 500, more or less 20 years. Um, Google, uh, about seven years. Facebook, less than five years. And if you look at, at Tesla and then uh, things you know, going further, uh, actually Oculus Rift was worth $1 billion in less than two years. And then they got bought up by Facebook. Imagine that you started Oculus Rift. You, in two years, you have a billion dollar worth company and Facebook buys you, right? You wouldn't need to go to MBA classes anymore. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so, so you, you see that the, 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 the exponential technology growth has exponential impact on, for example, company, possible company valuation as well. So I wanted to show you a, a few interesting slides. These are slides from uh, the 19th century, people imagining the world in 2000, more or less our world, right? So you see people flying these balloons and there's a, there's a, there's a train pulling houses and this here is a, is a, a, a cinema and then you see uh, how uh, the, 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 the police inspection would work, 
right? This, these are, so for any of you who are Germans, these are German pictures. The French, you, you will see the culture difference. These are French pictures, right? So, so a bit more sort of flamboyant and, 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 and creative, uh, right? Um, so, so these are French pictures. Uh, I'm, I'm most excited by these two. Uh, so you see a teacher grinding books. And then the grind, ground books, you know, the, this goes through wires into your head. I think, I think you should implement it at, at, M, at MBA classes at Globis, right? I, I think that would be fantastic. And then you see, this is interesting. I'm a, an av avid diver, so I go and dive with sharks and with not strange animals. So I know what's in the sea. In the 19th century, people were still un unaware of what animals existed in the sea, right? So they were imagining that th these were the type of fish and the divers would be sort of, you know, using them as horses, sea horses, right? Um, anyway, uh, so what, what happens next then in, in 1960s, this is American, right? So you see clearly American cars and, and, and you know, you see cars like this. This is uh, farm automation. This is push button education. So people have these buttons, you know, you go and push buttons and that's how you learn and whatnot and whatnot. What do you see in these three pictures? Clear tendency that we see the reality through the lens of the, rea the current reality, right? Now at that time, Technology was not developing as fast as it's developing right now. You have no clue, and I have no clue, what we're going to be doing in about 10 years' time. What sort of technologies are going to be there? What, what, are we, what, what tools are we going to, going to use? In, in reality, you know, it is, um, it is predicted by, that more or less between 2030 and 2050, we'll be able to download human consciousness, the, 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 you know, your, your consciousness into cloud, right? So your body stops being necessary, right? Why do you need this body that needs to go to the toilet, needs to eat this McDonald's food and, and the, the beef? And, you know, if, you, if we stop eating beef, we reduce the bodies and we up upload our consciousness into cloud, right? You will not have water problems. And, and you, will need no, you will not need water, actually. So what, what could our reality be? We, we don't know, right? But clearly, it's not going to be what it is right now going to be very different because the, the speed of technological change is extremely different to the, those times. So anyway, uh, the future cannot be predicted, but futures can be invented. Uh, and this is a message, clear message for you um, as, as, as people interested in leadership. You cannot predict, right? You, you can try, you can understand the data, you can use your intuition. Sometimes you hit the right, the right prediction, sometimes you won't. But you can invent the future. So rather than thinking of who am I going to be in five years' time, start inventing yourself, reinventing yourself, right? Uh, and, and start looking at, at yourself as, as you are as a person. Um, so um, I have a lot of slides more, uh, but I think it's, we're coming into uh, 8 uh, p.m. Now, uh, what, is, what, is, what, what, what my final message for you is, um, so this is disruption. This is innovation, right? This, it's about the new world. It's about the new creation. And, you know, you, you learn things. You learn content. You learn marketing. You learn finance. You learn, um, you know, you learn everything that, that you need by attending classes, for example, like MBA classes at, at, at Globis. But what's going to happen in, in reality, you will need to apply those skills to create completely different values than what we used to create so far. Um, because um, this, this happens right now. So with Kodak, they still, oh, you know that Kodak had, had the, um, the patent for digital imaging when they were going bankrupt. They owned the patent for digital cameras. And the reason they, they didn't use it was because they, they felt it would cannibalize the existing products. And they missed, they missed the fact that it was not only digital cameras that were developing, AI was developing, cloud, internet, microchips, digital imaging, everything connected right now created this, this, this uh, you know, camera that you have in your phone. I use Google Photos. Do you, anyone who use Google Photos? Yeah, one person too. Brilliant, isn't it? It uploads automatically all the pictures that, it, that you've taken. Now also, 
you can search. You search for, let's say, a cute cat, right? And if you have uh, pictures of your cute cats, your, the, the cute cat pictures are going to come up. Uh, you search for, uh, let's say, um, my wife, right? <laughs> and uh, my wife comes up, or maybe someone else's wife comes up. But <laughs> that's still uh, under, you know, under, under consideration. But you can search. It also creates albums for you automatically. It suggests things, right? So, and you don't need to store the pictures in your phone, and it's all for free. Right? It's just, just try using it. Sorry to Microsoft guys. But anyway, uh, this is, I'm going to close with this because it's, it's very relevant to, to, to the leadership discussion, which is we have still three different types of economies operating in this world. Right? Uh, I spoke at a uh, governmental summit uh, in China twice, uh, last year and the year before. Uh, actually, my company was a, a, a co, co, um, Jesus, co, co, not, not co, co producer of the, the summit last year. Um, and what China is trying to do is they are trying to implement what's called one road, one belt strategy, which is remove itself from industrial economy, from its industrial economy roots, move, jump through the knowledge economy into creative economy. Uh, so let's just make sure we, we've got the, the definitions right. Industrial economy is production, right? So we produce, you mass produce things. Knowledge economy is finance, it's marketing, it's services. And then creative economy is about bringing new value. It's a startup reality, it's a Silicon Valley, it's a Merukari in Japan. Um, but anyway, uh, what they are trying to do is to export all the production to uh, Silk Road, uh, countries like Uzbekistan, all the stands, and Africa. And they are trying to rethink the uh, the uh, professional education, so all the engineering degrees and so on and so on, and introduce soft skills and introduce imagination skills into their curricula, just so that engineers are not focused on making the same widgets, but they are looking for new ways of, of creating value. But anyway, so in the industrial economy, all you needed is diligence and obedience. So you were the ice cutter or the ice producer, right? You need to do things fast. You need to be efficient, right? You need to do more, more of the same things in less time. This is the Japanese, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to say that, but I'm going to probably get arrested for this. But the premium Friday idea to me is wrong, completely wrong. You know, you don't tell people who are overworked and they are using wrong, they are doing wrong things to go home early on Friday. You need to rethink the way that people work and, you know, what the value of work is and what, what are we doing actually uh, here. Um, so, you know, if you move into work 2.0, the knowledge economy, you have uh, the, the, the in, in, in intellect and then the, the, the professional knowledge that you need. So being a, a good accountant, for example, you need to, to think clearly you need to have the, the accounting knowledge. So if you're working at an accounting firm, like, you know, wherever, you, you need to be diligent, obedient, and then have your knowledge. Now, the reality is that it's going to be automated very soon, right? AI is coming into, uh, into a, a lot of, of areas. For example, lawyers. Any one of you who are lawyers, I'm, I mean, really, really, you should start thinking of what, what value you're bringing because, uh, you know, AI can, and can solve legal problems very easily because law is fixed, right? It's not something, you don't create value. You don't bring new ideas. You, you, you apply law, you apply rules against a situation. And that's a typical, you know, algorithm pattern. You have a, you have a, a set of rules and you have a situation and, and a, a computer can do that. So anyway, so what do we need in the work 3.0 right now? We need initiative, we need to call them. And it's always about challenging yourself. It's always playing at the edge. It's always, you know, pushing the boundary. Um, and, you know, there, there's plenty of ways to, to, to enact leadership. And I, I believe that leadership can happen in every moment. And there are three simple types of moments. The moments you respond to. So if you get a phone call, you pick, it, you pick the phone up. When you get a question, you, you, you answer. Um, then you have the moments you create. So you call or you ask the question. And then you have the moments you elevate, which could be any moment, right? It could be a moment when your uh, colleague comes to work and they look a bit worried and, and you just choose to elevate the moment and you choose to come up to them and say, would you like to have coffee? You know, I'm, I'm just going to buy some coffee, come with me. And then this could be a life-saving situation for this person because you're, 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 you're being there for them, right? You, you, don't, you don't need to ask, you know, deep personal questions, but just by being there, 
there for the moment with the person, create a different opportunity for a lead leadership uh, relationship there. So anyway, in those moments, you can you can you can enact, you can have choices, right? You can you have more choices. Um, if you have more choices, you become more flexible, and that sort of helps you expand into the Fibonacci sequence pattern. So, you know, that's all from me uh, today. Uh, Kelvin, if you want to say um, a few words and uh, introduce my partner, Mark. Uh, that yes, fantastic. yes. Uh, yeah, I would like to thank you so much for your presentation and great insights. Thank you. Thank you. Peter, I was reading your website, and yes. one of the... Uh, uh, phrases on it was, we need new kinds of leadership to yes. create a better tomorrow. What does that mean for Japan? What are these new kinds of leadership? Wow, interesting. Um, I, I think that Japan um, Japan is a, a very interesting cross crossroad. It's either going to fail drastically or, com or, or, or really succeed fabulously. I think there's nothing, nothing else, right? The, the current situation is not going to last. Um, so the way the economy works, the way uh, people um, live their lives, right? They enact their identities and being Sarariman and, and Oeru and who not. You know, it's not going to continue. It's not sustainable. The the way um, that um, the economy is based around, you know, uh, large organizations, you know, employing hundreds of thousands of new grads every year. It's not going to last, right? Because large organizations don't create new new positions, new jobs. In Japan, actually, majority in the in the world as well, majority of uh, um, of new jobs are created by startups and, and and SMB companies, right? That that open new businesses. So anyway, um, what that means to Japan is um, that there's a, an interesting set of opportunities. I think um, one is the inbound globalization. The second is the outbound globalization. So tourists coming, foreigners being, you know, being more active here. Uh, in terms of, for example, people starting their businesses, people like me, like you, uh, some of you may be uh, entrepreneurs here. It's easier. It's actually easier to start a company in Japan than in, ma in many other places in the world. Um, the co one of the co-founders of Zynga moved to Japan, uh, and uh, he's working in, in, in secretly right now on building a, a new business. And I asked him what, why he moved to Japan. He said, "Look, in Silicon Valley, you have all these engineers who are just so ridiculously um, useless, but you need to pay them, you know, three, four times as, as much as an engineer in Japan. They are not loyal. They leave, uh, and they are not actually, you know, robust enough to build the." code that, that I need. That's, that's what he said. The second uh, opportunity is the outbound globalization, which is about bringing the, the best of the Japanese technologies and companies and the hospitality to the world, right? So there's a lot of movement right now around people trying to promote Japan, trying to promote traditions, bringing, you know, uh, new, so the, sort of the, the, the Japanese new thinking into the world. But there, there's, a, there's something missing, which is you go to, you go outside of Tokyo, you have companies that have technologies that are really great. Nobody knows about them. Right? They have no one who speaks English, for example. Uh, my friend called this Japanese company because um, they, they produced the, the technology to build um, lenses, glass lenses, They're very thin and, and very, um, very robust, actually. And, and he wanted to uh, help them sell in Europe. And <laughs> so he called in English. Obviously, nobody, they, they didn't even pick up the phone. I mean, they picked up the phone, but they, he heard, uh, uh, uh. And then he heard uh, silence, right? So he sent them, he, he didn't find any, any email address on the website, so he sent them a letter. And uh, it took six months to get a response saying that we are very sorry, we don't have anyone who speaks English, right? And so he started looking uh, across Asia and he found another company in Korea. He called them perfect English. In perfect English, they responded uh, within a, an hour or so. He had a, a CEO meeting and then he ended up uh, importing the, the, the Korean product, right? And the third opportunity is, I, I think, something around the, the, the Japanese culture and, and, and then Za Japan way, uh, right? Which is, I mean, Japan is a, is a very, very interesting beast, isn't it, right? So you, you look at Japan right now, and historically, obviously, with the war and, and, and its effect on the politics, etc., Japan is sort of 
you know, sitting here and people come and criticize and, and Abba son says, mm, yes, and then he op apologizes maybe. Um, and then um, Trump arrives and, you know, he starts yelling at China. So, so Abba son packs his suitcase, goes to talk to Trump. Out of, out of a sudden, you know, they are friends. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting way of, you know, interacting with the world that is non-conflictual. -conf Right? And in the internet uh, reality right now, any conflict becomes expanded very quickly through the technological, you know, through, through sort of the, 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 the internet uh, exponential communication. And, and if you look at Japan, you know, it's, it's, yes, there's all these articles about how ridiculous the economy is and how this and that, but nobody actually comes and bombs Tokyo. They haven't yet, right? Um, they go to Paris, they go to London, you know, they go to Europe. Um, so, so there's, there's something in this country that is constructive, and I think that should be brought, brought to the world. So I would say the new leadership for Japan is in, in taking care of the inbound globalization, outbound, and, and making sure that the, the best of Jap Japanese culture and the traditions, you know, the omotenashi, the wabi-sabi, and whatnot, it's, gets translated into other languages and, and published. What does it mean for you know, the people in our audience today, for example, Japanese women who may be in their 30s and 40s and who are looking uh, for the next thing in their lives? What does the new leadership mean for them? I think they should read my second book. Uh, I'm joking. The reason being is I went to Tsutaya. I talked to, no, I, no, I didn't go to Tsutaya. I talked to Tsutaya. I had a meeting with Tsutaya producers. And they, you know, they use the T, T point card. And Tsutaya is actually, all the business is about data, right? So they, they get data, user data, and then they uh, aggregate it and they create other businesses. So they looked at, um, at the, 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 the data of the people who bought my second book. Uh, and there's a big skew, so if you look at the, the age, right, so this is the age scale, and then this is male, this is female. So there's a big skew around like 30 to 40 year old, uh, between 20, late 20s and, and before 40s, males. And then there's, there's not so many women that re read my book, right, so about 20 or to 30 percent of the, the readers were female. But there's an interesting spike, and two spikes, women at 27 and women at 35 have read my, a lot of women, there's a sales spike at that ages. And I, I was trying to understand this and I, I thought, you know, women at 27, this is a reality where in Japan you, you are already a, a Christmas cake, right? Uh, or you're married. Um, so, so these women are, start looking for new identity, new ideas, and what do I do with myself? Do I become professional? And then obviously by 35 you may have be become a mother, but also you may have become a manager, right? So that there's a, there's a search. For women, what that means, uh, first, after reading my book, uh, what that means is um, how do you actually, how do you get yourself out of that mold of the, the, the traditional thinking around one identity. So I see that this happening in Japan quite often. You are a kokose, you are a oeru, you are a, a shufu, right? So there's a clear role, clear identity that, that gets put onto your face where you go out. Uh, and, and you actually, ironically, a lot of women, they love having that identity, right? And they, they are a super shufu and you have the super shufu bangumi and they are, or they are super oeru and they read all these oeru magazines, right? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of uh, being cheeky with you ladies here, but, but there's more to life than one identity. You can be a perfect, uh, perfect uh, businesswoman and you can be a perfect wife at the same time. And you can be a perfect mother, you can be a perfect, um, you know, a daughter, you can be a perfect um, um, sister at the same time, right? So how do you enact more identities at the same time rather than just getting stuck in this, do I work or do I get married? You know, when I get married, do I have children or not, right? It's, you, can, you can have more identities around the same time and how do you sort of operate those uh, effectively will determine the level of happiness. And uh, Japan is probably the only country in the world right now, the only developed country that, in the world where, where the, thing, the, the women's thinking, it's not, I'm not telling that men tell, tell you to, to do this, but women's thinking is still so narrow around you know, those sort of basic identities, uh, being a daughter or being a, uh, a mom or being uh, you know, uh, an employee, etc. I don't know if that tells you anything, but just expand and, and look for more um, stimuli uh, in your life would be a, 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 
and advice. And I'm going to shut up in a moment to, to, to let you speak as well, but um, I said something uh, in, a, in a panel discussion at a women organization the day before yesterday, which was, I was asked, what, is the, what are the strengths of Japanese ladies and what are the development areas? So I want to also mention the strengths. I think that the, the, the Japanese women are the, the, are the strongest living beings in the world. And as strange as it sounds, because if you look at Darwin's theory, uh, it's not the it's not the strongest um, uh, it's not the strongest element in an ecosystem that survives, but the most flexible, right? So the best surviving animals are the most f flexible uh, animals. And Japanese women are the most flexible people in the world, I think, right? They can be. They can be nice and smiley, but when you go out, they can, you know, they can be, you know, they can be also fierce, right? And they know how to play the game of, um, of human relationships, right? And they also, Japanese women are very, very committed and very uh, strong um, workers. I, I've seen both in Morgan Stanley and in Google, actually some of the strongest employees that we've ever had uh, and were women. And Japanese women, ironically, Japanese women with children, families, getting to very high positions, both in Japan and uh, in the world, for example. If you look at the amount of employees that Google shipped from Tokyo to Mountain View and Silicon Valley, majority of them are women, actually, not men. Not Japanese men, Japanese women. Right? So there's, this, there's something in you that, that you have, but it's about just choosing to switch this, to, to, you know, you have the switch. You press it, then you, you go. If you don't press the switch, then you don't go. And I, I don't know what that switch means, but find the switch and press it for yourself. You mentioned happiness. Uh, two of the, the most common questions I get from Japanese women are, um, what do I need to do to be happy, and how do I get the confidence to do it? I mean, not just for the mm -hmm. Japanese women in the audience, but for the men as well. Mm -hmm. What does all of this mean yes. for them in terms of where do they practically start? I mean, we see, you know, uh, Workplace 2.0, we hear mm -hmm. about innovation and the new leadership, and it's, it's very uh, intriguing and compelling. Mm -hmm. But when they get back home yes. Friday night, 10 o'clock, um, and they're looking around the apartment and they say, geez, I got to start this routine over Monday morning at 6 a.m. and drag myself off uh, in a crowded train mm -hmm. to work. Practically speaking, where do they start? That's an interesting question. Uh, you should you should answer it because you've written a, a book uh, for, for Japanese women. But um, I, I think you know uh, I, I like um, you know I'm partially a psychologist, so I like I like to look into sort of what, what happens in in, uh, in reality. But um, Carl Jung said that one of the the single most uh, the single most reason for unhappiness is the pursuit of happiness. Right? So what that means, if you, the, if you really want to be happy and start looking for happiness, you're going to be unhappy. Because you're start, you, you, this, this means you, you, you dismiss the current moment. You say that you're unhappy. You, you, you dismiss the good things that are happening in, in, in the reality. Right? If you actually calm down and say, oh, I'm happy, I'm fine. It, it becomes easier to, to identify new areas and, and, and spread out. Um, so. You know, I, I had um, I had this very weird experience with uh, with a friend of mine who's um, a flight attendant, um, and um, I ended up having drinks with her. And uh, she's a very calm sort of person, and she 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 talks uh, very calmly and ref is very reflective, very 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 sort of soft, soft, very nice person. I ended up um, talking to her for thirteen hours. 13 hours, imagine, from 5.30 in the morning till 6 a.m. I mean, sorry, from 5.30 in the evening till 6 a.m. in the morning. This was the first time I've ever done it in my life, and I probably won't, won't do it again. But talking to someone for 13 hours, and the reason we talked so long was she's going through a big identity crisis, and what's happening is she's trying to leave the, the you know, flight attendants are practically uh, waitresses in planes, right? So it's, it's very tough work. It's very, also, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's it's a very top-down environment, and, and 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 for some reason, women when women work with women, they can be very cruel to each other. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm po politically incorrect, but but it's very typical in hospitals. It's very typical in in air, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in airplanes and and so on. But she was sort of going through all these dilemmas and talking and talking, and 
her, um, her way of solving the situation is she wants to enter an MBA course, not Globis, unfortunately. I did recommend Globis, but she wants to go to New York because she loves New York. She wants to go to business school in New York. And after getting the MBA, she wants to emigrate to the US. That's a very typical pattern, which I, I really get pissed off by, which is and a Japanese woman, bilingual, uh, could be very successful and bring a lot of value to Japan, chooses to run away to the States. Right? That's not the, the way to find happiness. I think if you want to go, you know, that's fine. But first identify simpler ways of, of implementing, um, of, of making your life sort of more, more bearable. Um, it could be uh, increasing, you know, improving the communication with your boss. It could be um, trying new hobbies. It could be, you know, finding ways to, um, you know, to be promoted or moved within the companies. I, I see sort of ladies get, getting stuck in this one thing and then they want to escape, but they don't, they don't make three steps. They escape here, right? It's like jumping out of a plane. That's what she's trying to do right now. And I told her, you know, wait until the plane lands. You're not going to jump right now. Just get off when the plane is on the, on, on, on the, you know, on the, on the, on the ground. I don't know if that answers. What, what, what is your advice? I'm really curious. That they should buy our books. Yes. Wow. <laughs> No, but, but tell, us, tell, us, tell us, tell us, tell uh, us, tell us. Yeah, I think maybe it's related to our definition of uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think we share that uh, where innovation is, it's basically creativity. And it seems like innovation is on the lips of everybody mm. today. You go to any yes. major company, they're chasing innovation. We need to create an innovation lab. We need to... Yes. Oh, but whoa, whoa. It's like, uh, don't get me started, because that's a funny one. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost as if, uh, you know, I wake up one day and today I shall be innovative. But I don't think it really works that way, does it? You, it's, it's a long process mm. that may start in childhood. Yes. Through many experiences and many touch points and connections. And it, it comes from there. But... Mm. Yeah, and I think the uh, the creative part is uh, the aspect that provides happiness. And like you said, the money is just the the fuel in the gas tank yes. to to make your creative engine work. Right? Mm. And but those are just my thoughts on it. Um, with respect to some of the uh, data you put up, Japan, the one point three percent in terms of uh, entrepreneurship. Um, do you know, is it more concentrated in the rural areas? For example, you mentioned mm. the SMEs yes. and those uh, kinds of companies that have a lot of uh, perhaps IP quality expertise and knowledge. Is, is it distributed evenly or is it skewed to the city, to the country? It's very skewed. Um, it's very skewed. I mean, uh, you've got the, the right point here. Um, a majority of the startup activity right now in, in Japan is, um, it goes Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka, Sapporo, uh, Nagoya. Right, and then there's a, or there's a chasm. There's a, almost nothing, nothing in the the countryside. Right, if you look, if you look at any startups that come from countryside, um, you know, there's just a bunch of them. I think that really, really I mean, a small bunch, and that that's it. Um, I think the reason being is is obviously Tokyo is a, is a, is a really really interesting place. Right, and I, I love Tokyo. I, I, Google wanted to ship me to Silicon Valley and then I, 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 I quit because I wanted to live in, in Tokyo uh, and, and for, for, for various reasons. I mean, look, Silicon Valley, just, just don't, don't get excited about Silicon Valley. It's, it's, it's too crowded right now, right? It's, it's in a bubble. Uh, if you are an engineer and you want to start a startup, just do it in Tokyo or somewhere else in, in Asia. It's easier to get money. It's easier to get funding in, in Japan than it is in Silicon Valley. Uh, there's less competition. Uh, the VCs are, uh, you know, less educated, so they will give you money freely. Uh, I mean, less experience maybe. They're not less educated. But And then uh, then you have all these perks and the government is trying to be nice and it's so easy to, to register a company. You know, you, you, you can do it in, with than a day. Um, also, the, the Tokyo is a very interesting place. Uh, Fukuoka is trying to get there, right? Fukuoka, is the, the, the city government is trying to increase uh, entrepreneurs, and they are trying to attract foreigners as well to come. Um, and, um, and yet, Fukuoka is very small. It's very compact. It doesn't have the, the diversity that Tokyo has. Tokyo has first finance. It has uh, technology. It has arts. Uh, it has um, 
uh, fashion, right? And it has a lot of other places. I'm not going to go there, but you know, uh, think Roppongi, for example, right? It, you find everything. You find a diversity that only probably maybe London and New York have, right? But um, if you look in America, for example, you have the East Coast and you have the West Coast. Uh, and it takes about what? How many hours? Four, four hours, maybe from yeah, four and a half, five hours from New York to uh, San Francisco. And then you go to New York, and obviously there's arts and whatnot, but sort of majority of people still earning money, earning decent money uh, in the Wall Street, right, or in advertising. But you see people sort of more more formal. The culture is a bit different than than in California. You go to California, you have these people in t-shirts riding bicycles, and you know uh, some of them who have more money, they they drive their Teslas, right, or hybrid cars, and and would not. You and then you have LA, where, which is the film and, and sort of the, the flamboyant entertainment uh, place. You go to Tokyo, and uh, and I'm I, you know I'm, I'm still mind blown by 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 the the fact that you go to Otemachi, and you have people in suits, right? You and you don't see you don't see young people in Otemachi. I mean, you see young people, but they wear suits and they look old. Um, you go to Shibuya. Uh, or 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 or, or uh, Ebisu or Daikayama during the day you don't see people in suits right almost you see young people and 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 Otemachi has the banking um, Shibuya and Daikayama and we're not has the startups right then you go to you know wherever you want to go to Harajuku and you get the fashion and it's such a close distance you, you can get from Shibuya to Otemachi in what, what 30 minutes maybe less by train but nobody, there's no cross-pollination, right? The startup people don't go to talk to the Otemachi bankers. The Otemachi bankers and the government people don't go to Shibuya to look at the startups. Um, there's, there's, I don't know why, you know, like, it's, and there's a huge opportunity if those areas, areas really start rubbing against each other. I think Tokyo could become uh, way more attractive to startups and investors than Silicon Valley. I think it could. It has the potential. That, that's really interesting. Do you have that Kodak slide by any chance? Could we put that Kodak slide back? Uh, on? So I need, I need to probably oh, just return right. to yeah. it. But well, if, if it's you, too much just, trouble, don't worry. Just uh, so people. Could. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah let's uh, let's do it. When, when you were talking about that, it just uh, it struck uh, a chord for me because it seems that there are a lot of government programs to get people started. Yes. But it also seems that once you're started. They actually may be at cross purposes to nurturing and growing the venture and yes. getting it off the ground. Yeah. You know. yeah. Any insights on that from your experiences and venturing and um, entrepreneurs in Japan? So it, it's it's uh, well, wow, it's a very deep question. You so you put me into a trance state for a moment. Like I was like, oh, <laughs> that's a question. Um, it's it's interesting. I I don't know if I should say that, but. Um, I had a meeting with the, the, the people in charge of the startup, um, of the startup um, ecosystem in Fukuoka, right? And, um, and it was a very interesting meeting, very nice people, like very nice, very, you know, active. And, um, y you know, you could see there were three of them, me and then three, three people, right? Uh, but yet only one of them was really sort of really, I think, aware of what the startup reality is, right? Uh, they're in charge of, of building startup um, um, startup ecosystems in the, in the city. But I, I, I thought they were still, I mean, uh, nothing wrong with that because they're learning, but they, they, the, the, especially the most senior person was way detached from, you know, what, what, the, what a startup person really needs, right? So, you know, I, I, I was... I was, I'm a startup person as well, so they, they, I, I didn't feel that they really grasped my needs when they were asking me questions. Um, so there's still a lot of learning that I think the government has to, to do to stretch, right, and, and, and understand what, what, what it takes, you know, how much pain it takes for a, for a person who has a completely new idea to bring it to, bring it to life. And then I think there's, there's something, you know, there's, there's also something around... Um, creating a network for those people, um, a support network. There are support networks for entrepreneurs in, in Japan, um, but none of them is governmental, actually. Um, so, so I think you know this. The, the, it's 
I'll, I'll give you a clear, a clear and, and funny example. Um, so Fukuoka started this visa, uh, six-month visa for foreigners who want to come and, and, and sort of look around and see if they can start a startup. And they also, um, the, the, there are some other perks that come with that. And I was talking to, to, to them and I asked, um, so how many people so far, that was last year in August, I think, how many people so far have, have taken um, you know, the opportunity to, to really, you know, take this visa. Um, that was somewhere around 20, <laughs> 20 people, right? And, um, and they said, oh, but actually we're better than Tokyo because Minatoku has apparently the same system and Minatoku has less than 20 people. <laughs> but, but I mean, it was so, so funny, like, right? Less than 20 foreigners. I wasn't aware that, that, that Minato had, uh, had the, the, the visa system. And you look at the, you know, you start searching. Yes, it's on the websites, but you know, like this, it's on the website, but it's not advertised. It's not shared. It's not, you know, it's not out there. There's no sort of uh, governmental, you know, campaign for foreign entrepreneurs and so on and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm maybe not, not answering the question clearly because it's a very complex um, complex situation, but I, I think the government is, is taking the right steps, right? But, but it takes, you know, it takes time for people to, for, if you're an, if in administration in Japan, you know, you know well that, that it takes time, it takes loops. So by the time people come up to speed and understand what startups mean, it's going to take some time. So I, I think, you know, I, I, I just, I just, you know, don't, I, I wouldn't go to, if you wanted to start a company, I wouldn't go to the to city ward, I would go to, you know, some private organizations at this time, maybe in, in five years time, it's going to be different. Interesting. Because the reason why I brought up that uh, Kodak slide is because if you replace, you know, if you remember this Kodak on the right side yes. of the slide and all these industries on the yes. left, and if uh, Kodak was kept alive through subsidies or tariffs and so yes. forth, that could very well have prevented a lot of those other industries from mm -hmm. getting traction. Replace yes. Kodak with yes. Japanese rice farmers yes. or anything else yes. that gets a subsidy in Japan. Yes. So it, it sounds like in some ways the government is giving people a bit of a lift, but yeah. then when they kind of are taxiing down the runway and ready for takeoff, the status quo just kind of lands on everybody's shoulders because mm. they can't overcome these existing relationships and uh, the yeah. power structure that's yeah. already there. Yeah, it's very interesting. I met Koizumi Jr., right? And uh, he's very active in the uh, agriculture space. And he has, I mean, he has plenty of interesting ideas. And I think, um, I think he's, he's, he's um, bringing a new sort of new New wind into the the you know the the, um, the government right now, but um, I, I, I think it's 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 going to take time. I mean, it's not it's not that it's wrong. I think Japan still has to sustain some of the uh, economic um, apparatus that it runs the country, right? Because if you disrupt too many things at the same time, then you disrupt the ecosystem and then things fall apart and and. I think for an average Japanese person, especially living outside of Tokyo, to get used to the new reality, it still is going to take time, right? It's, um, it's I mean, the, the first the simple barrier, simple for most uh, barrier is language ability. I mean, um, I, I'm Polish, right? So my first language is, is Polish. I, I don't read anything in Polish, anything whatsoever. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even interested in the Polish economy right now, even though it's growing, because I know that for the size of what I'm trying to do and for the, the, the current uh, stage in my life, engaging with, the, the, the Pol with Poland as a country is not going to be um, a key to, to success, right? Um, all the information that I get is in English. M majority of information on anything that is new is in English because it's it's newest, right? So any new new technology, any new thing is is out there first in English. If I need to know something about Japan um, that is not available in English, I will read it in Japanese, right? But um, but how many Japanese do this, right? How many Japanese look at internet? in English first, um, and then in Japanese second. I mean, for those of you who speak English, and if you haven't done, just try. Just try looking for the amount of information, access to data points you will have in English versus Japanese. It's, it's unbelievable, There's, it's, it's, the, the difference is unbelievable, right? So, um, so that's one, one thing. The second thing is how do you sort of, 
you know, get yourself out of the, 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 the traditional sort of, sort of way of working. And I, I was watching, I was watching, it was brilliant. I was watching this TV, I was in Osaka, so I came back to the hotel, to turn the TV on. There was this program about this young guy who wants to become a fisherman. And he's something like 24 or three, I might, might have got uh, the, the, the numbers wrong, but he went, he was a frita, like frita, right? He is only um, two kosotsu, so he graduated from you know, mid, 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 mid school. And uh, he came to Tokyo and he was working in these restaurants and you know, doing host jobs and whatnot. He decided to straighten his life up. And he thought, you know, what can I do to, to be successful and what, what is something that I'm really excited about? And for some reason, he's excited about fishery. So he went to this small town, um, I, I, I turned the TV on in the, in the middle of the program, but he was in this small town where he joined this fisherman group. Like they have these co-ops, right? So they have a number of boats and they, they sort of rotate on those boats. And there's this, the, the, the Dancho, right? The, 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 the leader of the group. And the average age of the group, is this group, and the average age in the group is 55, right? Average. He's 24. The Dancho is 77. And he's the best fisherman that ever you know, anyone has ever seen in, in this village. And, and you know, the, the, the program sort of showed first him talking, then the, 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 the fisherman talking without him, and, and it, there's such a chasm in between them. So they, they were saying, this is, it's, it's been 10 years since we had a new joiner. So this is the youngest per person ever in this group. And they couldn't understand why he wanted to become a fisherman in the first place. So why, why is he here? You know, why, why does he want to come? And, um, and they said, well, you know, it's going to take him 20 years to learn fishing. And he said his vision is to be the best fisherman ever in three years and to learn all the, the, the tricks in, in, in three. And now the second interesting thing was that they were showing how he was learning from these fishermen. So, you know, he was on these boats and with them and trying to help. And the best moment ever in his life comes when he gets for the first time to be on the boat with the Dancho, with the 77-year-old the uh, leader of the group. So he gets on the boat and he thinks he's going to learn a lot. And this is this typical sort of, you know, Nihon no Shokunin, like the artisan way of, of teaching people in which the Dancho, he doesn't say anything to him, right? He just goes and does his job. And the poor guy is trying to, you know, like, you know, re replicate the, the, the movements and trying to do this and that. And, and, and the dancha is not even looking at him. He just keeps doing his job. So the poor guy is sweating and, you know, the, 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 like he's really scared and doesn't know what to do. And, and he's just repeating this, the, 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 the same movements. But it's obviously not, 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 not getting him anywhere because he doesn't get the information he needs, right? Uh, so in fact, in reality, if he really is going to learn from these fishermen, it's going to probably need, need 20 years to, to get up to speed. I believe that he probably could become a fisherman in less than a year if he's being taught in the right way, right? If he, that the information is being shared. But, but just the, the, these people are so used to the, 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 the fact that you have to put the young person through this experience of you know, suffering and trying to get up to speed. They are not used to verbalizing things, right? So, so, so what's happening for this guy is you know, he's, he's, he, he has to you know, learn on his own. And then the, the, the next thing happens. The, the boat arrives in the harbor, and then the, the, dancho, the dancho says, we're going to go to drink. And so they go drinking, obviously. And then he, they have a few, you know, a few glasses of sake. And then Dancho starts yelling at the guy, saying, oh, you don't, you know, you, you don't do this right. You don't do that right. You're not going to be a great fisherman. And it's a, it's a great metaphor for me for what's happening in, in large Japanese organizations, what's happening in small companies in the, in the countryside. There's, there's a need for developing better, you know, better and smoother communication. And there's a clear need for managers to be able to understand that the role of manager is not to manage, right? And the role of the manager is to, to develop. And that's the reality in the world right now, right? The management is, is this, um, how do you say se seakusetsu in, in English? Seakusetsu. The, what's the, the Japanese seakusetsu and seizensetsu. So the belief that people are, are, are bad. So current organizations mostly, the big existing organizations, they are based on this belief that people are naturally bad, right? That you, and you, what do you need to do? You need to manage them. 
Uh, you need to have compliance rules because if you don't have compliance rules, they're going to steal money, they're going to uh, rape women, and they're going to do what, what not, right? So you need uh, HR people come with the compliance handbooks and they're telling you how bad you are and you need you must obey all these rules. Man is born a sinner, right? Yes, yeah. man is born a sinner, right? And then there's, if you look at really successful organizations like uh, Airbnb and those those growing startups, they are based on Seizen Setsu, which is the belief that the, the, the man is, is, is good, right? We are good human beings. So they turn around the pyramids. I mean, if you look at the pyramid-shaped organization, what are pyramids? Pyramids are graves, right? Have you seen a pyramid? So a pyramid has very thick walls and it has uh, bodies inside, like you know, rotten bodies or maybe bones, right? And and the the the, the role of a pyramid is pr to protect the bodies from being you know taken away, and then protect um, the also protect the people outside from the smell uh, of rottening bodies, right? So sorry for the drastic metaphor, but but I believe that a, a pyramid-shaped top-down organization is like this. It's a it's a dying it's a it's a dying grave, right? Whereas new organizations are, are very uh, organic. They are li living organisms, and they, they, are, they are sort of a, 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 an upside-down pyramid in which actually the CEO's role is to communicate, narrate a clear vision, but also to develop people um, that report to the CEO, right? So build uh, executives. And the, the, the executives' roles are uh, to build the next layer of managers, right? So it's all, about it's all about growing, coaching, educating. And I don't think that is happening well in any large Japanese organizations. So that's the biggest, I mean, it's, it's a very simple thing, but I, I'm, I'm really curious. How many of you work, can you raise your hand if you work for a Japanese, large Japanese company? Just, I mean, I'm not going to do anything bad to you. Just, just, I'm curious. I mean, raise your hand like this so that the people in the back can see. Can you raise your hand a bit higher? Yes. Oh, fantastic. So maybe a bit half, half of you. Okay. So, ha so how many of you in the large uh, Japanese organizations have weekly meetings with your manager? Just, ra can you raise your hand higher? Okay. Um, how many of you have meaningful weekly meetings with your manager? <laughs> Right, so this is a problem. This, there's no there's no flow of information in, in the organization. There's no 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 growth. There's no development. Peter, we're coming to the top of the hour, but I wonder if you have time to stay with us for some questions yeah, from the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Please. absolutely. Let's open it up to questions from the floor, please. Yes. Sorry. There's a mic. There's a mic. There's a mic. Uh, thank you so much for providing a very thought-provoking speech. In the <laughs> so. I'm just wondering that, so as an innovative engineer, so what, do you have any hints or something to work as a group? Because a group. I, I'm just thinking that the Japanese tend to be good at working as a team, historically. Okay. So maybe there might be some kind of hints to mm -hmm. become innovative by fully utilizing those team working style. Okay, okay, fantastic. Um, if you look at, at, at Google, um, the, the research that Google does around um, highly effective teams, and I've participated in, in, in parts of this research, there's something that, that uh, comes out uh, very clearly, which is about psychological safety. And psychological safety is your ability to bring yourself fully to the work uh, environment, <laughs> as you are. So let's say if you're a, an LGBT person, uh, lesbian or gay um, or transgender, can you talk about this in, uh, in your uh, team, right? Uh, let's say if you have marital problems, can you talk about this to your team members? Um, then there's a set of two simple questions that you can gauge yourself, and I, I'd encourage you to, to reflect on those two questions. The first is, can I trust my team? Can I trust all my team members? Right? I'm not, I'm not going to ask you for answers, so just, just be fair with yourself. Is it a yes or a no? Then, can I respect all of my team members? Again, is this a yes or a no? So what happens if, if you trust people but you don't respect them? Um, what it means is, well, you're not nice guys, but you know, don't get any work done. Right? And I don't believe that they, they should be here. Maybe they should be somewhere else, but I'm better than, than them. Right? If you, if you, if you, if you uh, respect people around you, but you don't trust them, it's like, wow, you know, whoa, great knowledge, uh, highly skilled professionals, but they're probably going to stab my back. 
sooner or later, right? Uh, what are they talking uh, about with the manager, right? So uh, you, pr you probably have either of these, right? Like you, you, I'm, I'm just curious. I'm not, not going to ask you to raise your hand, but but probably you know some of you discovered that yes, either case is, is the case in, in my in my working environment, right? If that happens. No, no matter what you do, you can have the best perks and the best benefits, you can have the best working, the cutest office you can believe in, um, you can have the best mission for the team, you can have the best manager and the best, you know, sort of, I mean, maybe the, the best direction and communication. But unless that happens, you know, the, the, there's not going to be new value being brought in the team. So Google invests a lot in development of the, the, the psychological safety. That's why you have, uh, you know, mindfulness, those famous, you know, meditation rooms. That's why you have uh, emotional intelligence courses. That's why this search inside yourself, this whole uh, thing around, you know, reflecting who you are, what, what you are. Um, it's interesting because I had this conversation with my book edit. Well, I was interviewed by uh, what's the, the magazine Associate Associate uh, today, and we had this conversation, ex exactly the same conversation. Um, and um, and and if you imagine yourself, right? You what do you need to do as a leader when you build a team, right? You need to first be able to understand what the goal of this team be uh, would be, right? And you need to clarify that goal and and, and be able to narrate it. Then uh, you need to to have the right people on the team, and then you need to um, you know to deliver work. And majority of managers do this uh, mistake by saying, "Okay, let's let's gather, let's gather this new team. Maybe if it's a." a, a uh, a remote team, what often happens at Google, you know, they would fly people in. Let's say you meet in Singapore, you meet in Tokyo, uh, you go into a room and there's an off-site. And the leader would start talking, like they would say, um, let's, you know, this is our vision, let's discuss the vision, let's uh, decide the details. At the end of this two-day off-site, we're going to have drinks. This is completely wrong, right? You start with the drinks. <laughs> so, if you want an innovative team, you need to be able to first build um, the, the psychological safety. So, you spend some time on really understanding who the people around you are. Uh, ask them questions. You know, ask, understand their values and their beliefs. Uh, you know, good leaders ask questions that are deeper than than fa fact questions. It's like, uh, you know, uh, let me. It's just very very simple question. Can I can I can I borrow you? Uh, I'll borrow you because uh, she looked a bit scared of me. Uh, uh, how old are you? Um, so, uh, so, so, what did you have for lunch today? I had a sandwich. Okay, so that's the first question. Now, the second question, and you can you can think in your head. The second question: What food do you like? Uh, apples. Apples. Uh, what cuisine? What what type of cuisine? So, Japanese cuisine, Chinese cuisine. I like Chinese cuisine. Okay. Now, which question? Which question do you prefer? Uh, what did you eat for lunch, or what, what food do you like? I like the cuisine question. Right, yeah. Why, why do we prefer the cuisine question? Uh, could, could, could you, why, why did you like the cuisine question? Uh, um, I guess uh, the, um, I, c I can answer anything. Yes. I like. Yeah. Yes. You can answer anything you, you like. You have the freedom, right? You yes. have the freedom. Also, I'm interested in you more than just the, the, what you ate for lunch, right? I'm asking for your, 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 your preferences. So this is, it's a very clear, simple answer. But for example, are you, the question is, you know, do, do you go around and do you are, keep asking those questions to your employees all the time? You know, do you understand their, their, their motivation for being here? Do you understand why they uh, do what they do? Do you understand what they want to do next? And by that, you can establish the psychological safety. And then you, pull, you give people a big goal. And if they like each other, they, they respect each other, you give them a big goal and you say, good guys, figure this out and come back in a week. You'll see this, in, this much increase in, in, in ideas, right? And that's a simple answer. There's, there's way more, but just I'm, you know, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. We have time for a few more questions. Oh, uh, I, I think there was a, was Darren? Yeah, Darren, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks, Peter, for the presentation. No so for those of us in the big legacy corporations, whether in Japan or elsewhere, the options seem to be you're disrupted from outside or you disrupt yourself. 
internally. Mm. Is that going to be top down, bottom up? How do you disrupt a company internally? Wow. Um, I think the, be the, best, the best example is Toshiba. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, you know. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm sorry. I mean, I went from Toshiba. I'm really sorry, but um, I. Um, um, it's, it's a funny example that I keep keep asking. Um, how many of you have a TV? Like, raise your hand if you have a TV, right? So some of you don't, right? But how many of those who have a TV? How many of you really really utilize the remote control functions? All of the remote control functions. No one, right? I was watching TV and I pressed the button. I don't know what I pressed. I was sitting on the, so my, I didn't press. I was, I, I bottom pressed the, the something. And I didn't know what, what it was, but the, the I couldn't get back to the channel that I was watching, right? I couldn't. I like, I was going through the, 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 the buttons. And I, I asked, um, I, I, I said this thing in, uh, in an in a open seminar and, and the Toshiba person, Toshiba engineer came up to me and he said, you know, I understand what you're saying, but we cannot, you know, we cannot change the, the remote controls <laughs> And I said, why? Because all other companies are making similar remote controls. <laughs> what? Like, you know, like, where's this thinking coming from? If you look, how many of you have Apple TV? It has uh, how many? Uh, three buttons, right? Three buttons. You don't need more. And the, the software is in the in the, the device, right? And you 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 just move around, and, and then you have the interface, and then you can change. The software can be updated, right? So so. I say in Japanese that uh, Japanese companies are shōhin uh, shōhin jushi yuza mushi, right? So, for those of you who don't understand Japanese, you know, there's focus on the product, uh, disregard the user, right? Um, and and it's it's often it often happens. So you know, it's, it was a shocking experience to me, like for the person saying, "Why, you know, other companies are making similar remote controls, so cannot we cannot do anything else?" But Apple did. Right, and um, so how do you disrupt a company from inside? Um, I, I think I think you need to have clear ideas. B business people are not stupid, right? But they're put in. Um, I'm not so people are not stupid, but they are put in systems that don't work, right? And and I think the best idea is to disrupt the system. Having said that, uh, what I'm going to warn you is that this is very risky. Leadership is a risky job. So if you take leadership and start disrupting, you can, if you push too much, the system will kill you. So, so that, that's the reality, right? And that's why uh, big Jap not, sorry, not only big Japan, that's why big companies are struggling with, with disruption because they have the systems and the, the company system, by, by, I don't mean IT system, it's the company is an ecosystem as you know, the rules and the, the regulations, the HR procedures, they're built to deliver certain results. Right, so if you don't get the, so if you're getting poor results, it means that your company is built to deliver the results you're getting. So you would need to restructure and reorganize the company to bring different results. Um, I, I think that that's the, the most effective way. But if you want to do do it as an individual, I met this guy from Sharp uh, in Osaka. And, and Sharp, you can think of, you know, it's quite a, again, the, the next example being bought up by whatever it was, uh, uh, what's the company? So that bought Sharp? Huawei. Yes, Huawei. Um, and um, uh, it, it's a conservative company, but this guy, he looked like, he, he's older than me, but he looked like a street musician. Like he was wearing, he was wearing this sh uh, skirt. He was wearing a sort of like this, you know, these people in Harajuku that you know, guys wearing skirts. He was wearing a skirt, uh, like this T-shirt with a with a skull. He had this very weird, um, uh, weird uh, hairstyle, and he's responsible for new for Shinki Jigyo uh, Kaihats for new business development at Sharp in Osaka, and he is he became famous for being just completely disruptive in the company. But for some reason, he's very respectful to people. He's very liked. People love him, but he's different. He's just, you see, the, 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 he, he marks the, the he, he just makes a statement. I'm not gonna wear a suit, I'm gonna be different. You can fire me, but if you fire me for not wearing a suit, you know, that's gonna be quite a, 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 a big experience in, in the court, right? So he just made a statement and slowly, slowly, he, he built himself up, built the relationships, and he's very influential in the company, right? So, so how do you, 
you know, how do you, you, you sort of disrupt slowly, slowly, slowly and, and make sure that you have a community of supporters around you? Maybe this is sort of easier to implement at an individual level. Sorry for the, the you know, broad answer, but um, I, would, I would suggest that if you want to really innovate, you just leave and, and, and do your own thing. Sorry, but <laughs> yes. Uh, where do you see... How are you? Well, uh, a long time no see. Sorry. I, sorry. <laughs> I meant to email you. <laughs> it's okay. It is. Uh, how do you see the, the role moving forward of departments in what I call silos inside organisations mm -hmm. working with disruptive technologies to disrupt the whole framework of engagement? I see. I see. So, uh, you mean how, how can uh, siloed departments actually bring up... Well, what's your view on silos and the, and the ability to innovate and yeah. moving forward into the future in Japanese business? Um, I'll, I'll tell you a, a funny example. Um, I, um, we, we ran a, an innovation, disruptive innovation workshop with a large Japanese organization on Thursday and Friday. Uh, you know, their top R&D people. Uh, they've just restructured their R&D division. The, the, they have a new CEO. They, 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 they want to focus on new technologies. and So they, they, they are ready to challenge themselves. And uh, um, the, the, it's not a technology company, so uh, you know, we've chosen a, a way to uh, sort of familiarize them with, with technology by um, bringing robotic kits. And uh, th their task was, it was a, uh, it was this first sort of, first meeting of the new division, so we had a team building aspect in that, but we also had a strategy, sort of how do they really understand what's happening in the world. So we gave them robotic kits to build robots, and they were building robots, right, in teams. And it's really fun to build a robot. And you would not believe, but um, for example, we've done this with, with female leaders, and young Japanese women can build robots faster than, than, than young Japanese men, uh, ironically, um, if you break the, 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 the uh, biases. But anyway, it was hilarious to see because one of the groups, it was a group of eight people working with a large robotic kit and putting things together, and you, you had, you had these three, three, unfortunately, three women, right? Three women who they've, they've already, they, in their bias, they knew that they were not good in, with technology. They, that was their bias. So they sat in the corner and they were trying to put together these small, cute parts of the robot, right? And the, and, and the males were working on the, the engines and, 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 and the, because males are good with technology, right? I mean, that's the, the, the bias again. And they were sitting in, in the corner. And, and the three women were sitting there and, and they were talking. I was, I was just cracking because they were like, oh, what are these people doing, you know? Do, do you know what they are doing right now? No, I don't know. So let's put this together first. But do you know what these guys are doing? No. Hmm, okay, I don't know what they are doing, right? So in a team of eight people, right, in a task, you're sitting and you're asking the person next to you, do you know what the other guys are doing? That's already a silo. In a team of eight people, you can have clear silos, right? That was a learning to me. And uh, so then we reorganized the, the, them and we said, look, you know, this is what's happening. You need to sort of figure out a way to, to work together. Um, so I, I, I think, honestly speaking, any silo in an organization just kills, um, kills innovation. The reason being is there's simply three patterns of, of innovation. Uh, I mean, if it's an overstatement, but, but three patterns are very clearly visible. One is you break the rules, right? So you, you for example, you break the rules of the uh, hotel industry. And the, rule, the, the first rule of a hotel industry is that you have to have a hotel, right? Uh, now you break that rule and you say, why don't people stay in people's homes? Right, and you have Airbnb. Right? So that, that's one, one, one way to look at it. The, the second way to look at it is to uh, connect seemingly disconnected things. And you all have the best examples ever, which is a smartphone. Right? And as I said, you probably, if you had all the things you needed to use the same functions in the 1990s, you probably wouldn't be able to carry them. Right? You have a TV, you have a phone, you have a camera. You, uh, yes, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, that connection of these things created a, a smartphone. It took me a bit, a bit of time to get used to smartphones, I must admit. I got myself a um, 
touch, uh, iPod touch, and then I had the Gara, Gara no, uh, no, like the, the, the Ketai, and I liked the Ketai, and I liked the iPod touch, and I couldn't understand first why I should have the Ketai in the iPod touch and have an iPhone, right? But, but once I touched it, like once I really got to, to, to realize that I have ra running internet on my phone, that was, you know, the end of my, of my mobile experience, I mean, of the, my Gara, Gara K mobile experience. And then the third pattern is to bring uh, a solution from a different reality. And um, do you know Speedo, the swimwear? It's a very famous example of, of the Speedo swim, Olympic sw swimsuits, which was, uh, they, were, they were trying to, to create swimsuits in which uh, swimmers, Olympic swimmers, could, um, could swim faster. So they thought, okay, where is this swimming faster in water? Where is this problem being solved, solved already? Well, in the sea, right? Sea is probably most obvious. So who's the fastest swimmer in the sea? Sharks. So they put on their you know, diving gear and they looked uh, for sharks. Um, and yes, sharks swim very fast. They turn around very fast. And they were like, you know, well, we, we're going to put swimmers in the shark costumes, right? But they thought maybe there's something with the, the skin. So they looked at shark, shark skin. And it turns out that shark skin has this pattern of concave, these concave, you know, patterns. And there's a, there's a layer of air in those, those, you know, sort of holes. So shark is not actually swimming in water. Shark is flying in an in a, in a air balloon in, in the water. That's, that's the reality. So they recreated the same pattern on the swimwear, and these swimmers, Olympic swimmers, started winning. So the Olympic committee actually banned the speedo suits because they were too fast. But, but that's a great example of bringing a solution from a different reality, right? So what I, I'm trying to say, again, is if you have silos, you won't be able to bring different ideas, disconnect, so simply, so, so seemingly disconnected ideas. You won't be able to tap into a different reality, or you won't be able to break the rules because you're operating in, the, the, in, the, in a small, small set of rules. If you're working across silos, the rule sets are expanding. Thank you. So it's getting back to making those connections. Yes. To, to drive the innovation. Yes. Uh, Piotr, we've run out of time, but it's been an absolute delight having you. Thank Thanks you, for Mark. coming on a Friday <laughs> afternoon, your busy Thank schedule, you. to spend time with us. Let's show our appreciation to Piotr, please. Thank you very much.